robots and nest cells. What are they and why, yeah, sure. do, they, why do they fall? A relatively long-lived organism, and that puts you with, you know, that for anything that's living more than a few weeks, you have a bit of a quandary, which is in the normal course of your life, you lose cells. All right. Now, if you only live for a couple of weeks, it doesn't really matter. If you live longer than that, you've got to replace those lost cells. And so you replace it by cell division. This produces a real problem for you because you pick up most mutations when you're copying DNA. Because normally, you think about the famous double helix for DNA. You, if you have damage to one strand, you use the other strand to, uh, as a good copy to base your repair on. If you're busy pulling them apart to replicate it, you can't do that. And so you are more likely to, as we call it, fix mutations when you divide. So the more frequently you divide, the more likely you are to pick up mutations. And if you pick up four or five mutations, you have a tumor, which is bad news for the organism. And so the way in which this is dealt with is that cell division is actively monitored as an anti-cancer mechanism by a variety of different routes. Um, and after a fixed but variable number of cell divisions, irreversible exit from the cell cycle is signaled. In humans, most famously in some cell types, this is done by the shortening of chromosomal ends or telomeres. But there are other mechanisms that play in as well. We kind of have, an in, we kind of have version 2.1 of the cell senescence systems that are operating in rodents. We have a higher level of control because we live longer. Uh, exit from the cell cycle is signaled, senescent cells adopt a different, what we call phenotype of behavior. That the, first, you know, the least interesting thing about them is they will never grow again. And the most interesting thing about them is they kick out a load of inflammatory molecules, matrix breakdown enzymes. Some people call this set of inflammatory mediators, the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or the SASP. Um, that's not all that all cell types do. We showed some years ago that vascular smooth muscle cells, when they become senescent, forget that they are smooth muscle cells and start to think that inflammatory mediators and turn into little lumps of bone. And the last thing you want in blood vessels are little lumps of bone. It's like putting little bits of concrete in what should be a rubber tube. And we call this vascular calcification. And it's uh, the more calcified your vasculature is, the, uh, the more unhappy your life insurance company is about you, basically. And what is going on here is a combination of the cells trying to repair things Turning into bone is a kind of ultimate end-stage repair response. But more normally, trying to get cleared by the immune system. They are kicking out these pro-inflammatory cytokines because they want to be found. You know, we used to joke about this and call it the Lord of the Rings hypothesis because Gandalf says to Frodo, remember Frodo, the ring wants to be found. And so the pro-inflammatory cytokines are intended to lure particularly natural killer cells of the immune system to the senescent cell to kill it. And the matrix degrading enzymes are intended to help them along. So you can imagine, a if you can draw an analogy, imagine a senescent cell is like a suicidal man who has decided to take a rowing boat out into shark infested waters. He slits his wrists or cuts his wrists and then punches a hole in the boat. OK, the blood is the pro-inflammatory cytokines. The hole he's punched in the boat is the matrix degrading enzymes. And sooner or later, all he's got to do is hang around and wait for the sharks. Now, the problem with this is that your immune, two things. Firstly, your immune system is made of cells and it is aging. And so if you're 20 and you make a senescent cell, it's almost certainly clobbered immediately. By the time you're my age, that doesn't happen. And also... Because of the dynamics of the counting process, you start to make more senescent cells really at the time that your immune system is failing. 
So you get a kind of double whammy effect and you fill up with senescent cells and things start to go wrong. And so it's quite plausible in human tissues to see levels of six or 8% senescent cells. And in baboon skin, it can go as high as 15%. But those are the numbers. And you don't need many more than that to start to create profound problems with tissue. Because every one of those cells, pretty much, is a little focus of sterile inflammation. Does that help? Right. So do all cells, I mean, after when they've reached their division limit, do they become senescent or would some of them follow different paths like apoptosis or um so it, it's almost um cells that are um cells that are post mitotic like mature neurons or lens fiber cells don't really go in don't go into senescence okay um, some people use the word senescence but it's kind of stretched like a rubber sheet all right um apoptosis and senescence are very tightly tied together at the molecular level it would be almost impossible to design an apoptotic mechanism that didn't produce senescence. And it would almost be impossible to design a senescence mechanism that didn't produce apoptosis. You know, you will end up with both pretty much. Right. So some some go into apoptosis and some yeah. go into um, senescence. I mean, if you want if you want to get technical, the decision point on whether you go into apoptosis or senescence depends effectively on the life death rheostat, which is a complicated way, which is a complicated set of proteins which integrate the signals from multiple senes multiple cellular systems saying, am I in good shape or not? OK, and if the life death rheostat tilts to die, then you the cell goes into apoptosis. If it says you're basically fine, but a bit beaten up, you hang around in senescence and you get clear. And if you think about some of your listeners will probably have heard of senescence removing cell removing compounds, senolytics. The basic design looking for senolytics or the basic approach was to target that life death rheostat to distinguish between, you know, a cell that's fine and a cell that's beaten up. Because obviously you don't have to get rid of apoptotic cells because they do that for themselves. Okay. Mm. We accumulate more senescent cells, and, and this seems to be a mixture of the fact that we're making more of them and our immune system is incapable of removing failing them, clear. failing yeah. to clear them. So how do senescent cells contribute to aging? I mean, is it just the SAS that's causing kind of breakdown or is there other effects? Well, I think you can think, uh, we've, we've already started to touch on this a little mm. bit. So you will end up with, you can end up with age and you can, you end up with sterile inflammation. So you're pumping out pro-inflammatory mediators via the SAS. In vascular smooth muscle cells, you're also seeing this calcification mm. phenotype. In the cornea, we showed an unusual example of cells that didn't generate a SASP, but failed to make one important cytokine called interleukin-6. And the reason that probably messes up corneal function is because you need localized production of interleukin-6 in order to clear bacterial infections. And so you 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 then end up with a cornea that is marginally less effective at dealing with keratitis. Mm -hmm. you, you can you can go on with these things. That I think there's pretty good evidence that senescent osteoblasts are probably responsible for osteoporosis through failing to make the matrix down properly. You see a, a dysregulation of it being broken down versus it being built up. So it's built up by osteoblasts and broken down by osteoclasts. And this has always been, I, I think, a bit of a big open question, what's going on. However, we know that in mice, if you delete senescent osteoblasts, osteoporosis improves. So I think that tells us um, that that's something to target. Um, in the central nervous system, we know that if you delete senescent glia, you see an improvement in cognition. 
So, and since glial cells sit as support cells for neurons, they're just not doing their job properly. So there's a variety of ways in which you can do this. And actually, one of the things that I personally think is missing is there hasn't been enough thorough systematic data gathering on these different done quite a bit actually but it's nowhere near as much as i think we should be doing right interesting so, so we have all these different kinds of cells and senescent cells and so they all seem to have negative consequences but i mean the, yeah. the, the famous I mean, one is sasp right yeah i mean that that's the the, the, the don't forget the fame don't forget sasp is famous because it was heavily studied Right. And the more something is studied, the more it piles in until in the end, you know, it, until in the end, it, um, you can end up with a situation where everybody's studying it. So it's assumed to be the most important thing. Um, but what you end up with is everybody studies it because everybody relies on the literature and that's where most of the literature is. All right. Um, yes. Now, you know, and that is not, you know, that, that is not restricted to gerontology or even science. Um, it, it's just the usual, you know, I sometimes think it's probably an unfortunate thing to say, but that I think most disciplines suffer from an element of Homer Simpson's or immortal phrase where he turned around and said, I'm not popular enough to be different, Marge. Um, and speaking as somebody who definitely isn't popular enough to be different, I study the SASP as well. Um, so yeah, I, I I I think there is a heavy focus on the SAS because it's so obvious, but it shouldn't be thought of as the only thing that's going on. I mean, if we wanted to take a look at you know kind of the in toto effects of what happens in humans, which I, I'm always very keen on because of the evolutionary background, I think one of the best models that we see is a disease that. Um, I actually did my PhD on, which I'm still very, very interested in, called Werner's syndrome, which is the highest ranked premature aging syndrome in the original classification. So if you have Werner's syndrome, you have um, osteoporosis, you're prone to type 2 diabetes, you have cardiovascular disease. Um, you have a whole set of problems and you tend to die in your late 40s, early 50s, typically from cardiovascular disease or cancer. And it's also associated with a profound reduction in the ability initially of dermal fibroblasts where it was first reported to grow. So cells from an average Werner's patient grow about as well as cells from an average mouse. And if you think about the difference in size, that those tissue populations, you know, you're trying to, that's about the amount of uh, proliferative puff you need to keep a mouse ticking over. Okay. And you're trying to do a 90 kilogram human. Yeah. It, it's not a great deal. Um, but one of the interesting things with Werner when you dig into it is that these folk are actually mosaics. So some tissues age very fast and others are relatively spared, like the central nervous system, where you tend not to see pathologies that are not secondary to cardiovascular involvement, or the immune system, which holds up pretty well, actually. Um, and one of the things that, that we did a few years ago was we showed that tissues that were affected had the premature senescence, and tissues that were not affected didn't. And this tied into the different mechanisms that are used to trigger senescence. The Werner syndrome mutation is affecting one of them, but not others. And the, the, there are similar, the similar work in mice that shows the same sort of thing. But I think Werner's is particularly interesting if we are interested in what can we do about aging in humans, because I think it probably shows us, at least in some tissues, what the bad consequences that you can get from the accumulation of senescent cells. And I think it is something that we should be spending much more time on because to a first approximation, I think if a treatment works in Werner's syndrome, it'll probably work in you. Mm 
that there are i can hear the i can hear my colleagues typing frenziedly on their computers you know yes i am aware of the caveats but this is as they say a family show mm -hmm.